Okay, that's how I grew up playing Mario in the 80s. And all of you are here wondering what kind of spiritual application I'm going to find. You are saying, seriously, Joan, you're really going to find something from that? Well, I'll tell you, this is where it all began. The creative brains in the room, uh, I think you'll easily be able to follow me. And the logical brains, well, you're just going to have to try. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for all that you want to continue to do in this place, Jesus. And Lord, we give you the honor and the glory. This is about you. This is for you, Lord. And I pray, Jesus, that you would move, continue to move by your spirit in all of our hearts. Amen. The analogy of Mario conquering obstacles and walking through the door to the next level reminded me of my own journey in the area of obedience. I will share some personal examples in a bit. I see walking in obedience as a key to unlocking this, the next step in our journey. So, if I sense God is telling me to do something, and I do it, then the next time he whispers into my heart, I will detect his voice more easily. The opposite is also true. If he whispers something into my heart and I ignore him and do my own selfish thing, then his voice will be quieter the next time and I will have more trouble discerning his voice. In 1 Timothy, that is called a seared conscience, when the ability to do the right thing is fuzzy. Let's take a very practical real-life example. On Monday morning, I noticed someone doing an act of kindness on our driveway, snow blowing the drifts that have become so, so common this winter. Thanks, Brian. Brian had a thought that morning. Maybe I should go do some random acts of kindness and clear some people's driveways. He could have said, you know what? I much prefer to stay inside where it's warm and where I can watch the Olympics. And maybe the thought did cross his mind. Well, he didn't do the selfish thing, but he rather chose the unselfish thing. And I can assure you that if he had decided to stay and not obey the prompting in his heart, the next time that that prompting came, he would be more prone to stay inside yet again. And so it goes. With obedience comes more obedience. And with that comes a whole lot of joy because you've done the right thing and you've obeyed God's voice. Breaking the cycle of disobedience is possible, but it's much tougher. And once there's a pattern of disobedience established, is this making any sense? Tracking with me at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. I really hope my heart's going to come through because I have been so excited about this message all week. I had no clue what, what I was going to speak on. I knew it was my turn to come up and, and, um, and in the middle of Gav's message last week, it was just clear obedience. And I've been so excited about it. And then yesterday, it sort of went on a nosedive, and I said to Gav, I am never, ever speaking again, ever. So you all heard that? So my topic's on obedience, so I better obey what I'm, what I'm preaching. This is where Mario comes in again. If the obstacles are not conquered in the level, it has to be done again, okay? So if you have trouble obeying in a certain area, you'll probably be doing that again and again until you choose to obey. Let's take a look at the Israelites in the desert. And they continue to disobey time and time and time again, not conquering the obstacles and tests that God put in their way. And as a result, they stayed on that level for 40 years, going round and round the mountain. Instead of responding with obedience and trust, they stayed in rebellion and disobedience. Psalm 78 talks about how they continued in sin and didn't trust God even after all the amazing miracles that God continued to do for them. With obedience and trust, they could have entered the promised land and be filled with incredible joy, coming home at last. Over the past eight weeks, we have had some brilliant teaching and challenges along a common thread. Between Jason's Principle of the Path series and Gavin's teaching on uncommon courage, we have all been challenged to make some personal changes. We were challenged to make choices that would lead us 
in the direction towards our destination. There are choices that lead us closer to Jesus and his ways or away from him. So what were the areas or area that you were challenged so far? Because so far, every Sunday in this year, 2014, has been on those two topics. One of my personal challenges was being obedient in the area of exercise. Taking Jason's theme, it was my intention to get physically fit. But if my direction was staying in bed every morning when my alarm sounded, then I certainly would not reach my destination of being fit. So here's a very, very practical example of his challenge. On Friday morning, the alarm went and my mental gymnastics were in full swing. Okay, one side, stay in bed, it's cozy, it's warm. The other side, get up and go to gym. The other side, stay in, stay in bed. The other side, get up and go. And it was this, Gina and Gav told me at breakfast later that I shouldn't go there. Like, why go there, mom? Like, just do it. Well, I didn't. And it was going back and forth, back and forth. So anyways... At that moment, Jason's message and my doctor's orders won the battle and I ended up at the gym. Was it easier to go the following morning? You bet it was. If I had succumbed to laziness, the following morning would have probably kept me in bed again. You see how it goes. Obedience brings about momentum. So what was it for you? Looking at that crossroads, looking at which path, and I can... Any one of you who heard that challenge from Jason in the principle of the path and Gavin's uncommon courage, I know there was something, maybe one, two, three things that God challenged you on. In 1956, there was a young man named Lauren Cunningham who had a vision from God. The vision was that of waves crashing onto the shores of every continent on earth. When he looked closer in his vision, he realized that the waves were young people taking the gospel of Jesus to every nation. Four years later, after having many talks with his parents and friends about this vision, two of his friends made the first official YWAM trip to go and serve in another country. At the same time, his very wealthy aunt invited him to come and stay with him for a few days. They offered him a very lucrative job enticing for any young person. The question he asked himself, am I still going to be willing to obey? As hard as it was, he declined his auntie's offer and continued to give his life to expanding this vision that he felt God had given him. Fifty-four years later, because of one man's step of faith and obedience, Youth with a Mission is a powerful tool of God's kingdom being established in this world today. Today, YWAM has 20,000 full-time staff from more than 150 nationalities and a wide variety of denominations who serve at more than 1,200 YWAM locations in 173 nations. More than 4 million students, short-term volunteers and staff, have served with YWAM since it started in 1960. When I started with this topic at the beginning of the week, the word obedience was clear, but the word joy was, was not part of it. As the week progressed, I kept praying about the one thing that God wanted for this morning. Suddenly on Thursday, the words joy and obedience came together. And as I realized, it was like, yeah, that's what's in my heart. The word obey can be heavy. And people don't firstly think joyful thoughts. But when we get the freedom that comes with obedience, then joy is such a natural response. I googled the words joy and obedience. Well, it shocked me to see the opposing ideas that came up in picture form. With the word joy came what you would expect, all sorts of happy pictures, but with the word obey came a bunch of stern-faced men. Uh, no, like, it just happened. Like, I'm not saying this is what I saw, okay? Um, what I really sense from God's heart this morning is that he wants us to leave here wanting to be radically obedient with his results in inexpressible joy. Let's take a look at what the Bible has to say about the word obey. It comes up 206 times. The word obedience, 38 times. Most of the scriptures talk about how we will be blessed and how it will go well for us if we obey. One of the scriptures that popped out at me is from 1 Samuel 15, 22. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. 
and to heed is better than the fat of rams. Why is obedience so much better than sacrifice? We can sacrifice things for God and think that we've done our part, but what God is truly looking for is complete surrender and obedience. Obedience is the response of someone who is in a trust relationship with God. We trust God, we depend on him, and he takes the lead. Obedience is better than sacrifice because we are letting God be God and staying in our, in our proper place with him, the place of dependence and surrender to his goodness. This kind of obedience leads to intimacy and dependence. John 14 to 17, those chapters are full of amazing scriptures on both obedience and joy. Let's take a look at a few. John 14, Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love, love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. So I've talked quite a bit about hearing his voice this morning. How does the Holy Spirit lead? He certainly leads through scriptures, like the ones we've just read, obeying his commands, which are in the written word of God. In John 10, it talks about us being his sheep, and that as sheep, we hear the shepherd's voice. But how do we do that? Well, it takes, it takes practice, and it takes risk-taking and stepping out in faith. But how do we know if it's his voice? Well, firstly, let's take a look at something that all of us have. Some of us a little more sensitive than others, but we all have a conscience. Dr. Charles Stanley says this about your conscience and the role of the Holy Spirit. The conscience functions something like a computer. A computer is programmed to respond in specific ways to specific information. Also, it responds to information based on the commands it has been programmed to follow. When you click your word processing application, your computer knows which program to open. For the most part, computers are simply responders. The conscience is a responder as well. It responds to certain input just as it has been programmed. Paul described it like this. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. God has programmed his moral code into the heart of every man and woman. We are born with it. When a person's actions or thoughts violate that code, the conscience responds by sending a no message to the brain. On the other hand, when the act or thought goes along with the pre-programmed moral code, the conscience says, go. Notice that Paul says our thoughts sometimes point out the legitimacy of certain actions. When that happens, if the actions line up with the law of God written on our hearts, the conscience gives us the go-ahead. When you became a Christian, a change began to occur in your conscience. The basic moral code that everyone has at birth started to be overhauled. The spirit of truth took up residency in your heart. Then, whether you were aware of it or not, he immediately set about to reprogram your conscience. Whereas before you had a general sense of right and wrong, the Holy Spirit began renewing your mind to more specific and complete truths. You participate in this renewal process every time you read your Bible, attend worship, memorize a verse, or pray. The Holy Spirit uses all this input to reprogram the database through which your conscience evaluates every opportunity, thought, invitation, word, and deed. As this process continues, your conscience tunes in with the moral code of the Holy Spirit, a code reflecting the moral and ethical standards of God. This process sensitizes you not only to God's moral standards, but also to the will of God. So our conscience gives us direction in many ways, and as our minds are renewed by the Holy Spirit, our ears become more and more in tune with his voice, and we receive direction directly from him. For me, this is when the adventure of my faith truly began, 
when I realize that the Holy Spirit wants to give me direction every day. I now wake up asking, Lord, what is on your agenda for me today? I will give you a number of examples from my life where I followed my conscience and where I followed the Spirit's voice. Way back, I remember when I was five years old, I went to the co-op shopping with my mom. I saw one of the workers there taking a candy from from the box where there's those um, bulk candies. I went closer, and when no one was looking, I took one. This was my first memory of my conscience feeling so incredibly guilty and knowing that the only way free was to confess. I remember how hard it was for me to admit to my mom, first of all, that I was wrong. And of course, then, you know, as I was raised, we then went marched straight back to the co-op where then I had to confess to the manager there and ask for his forgiveness. But afterwards, what incredible freedom and joy. The joy of obedience. I could tell you a number of stories from my school years where I either cheated or did something wrong. I couldn't bear having a guilty conscience. And as soon as I confessed, there was the joy of obedience. By far the most difficult step of obedience in my life was when I left Canada to go to South Africa. The reason why I made this radical decision was because I was in a relationship that was not glorifying to God, and I knew that needed to change. I wanted to go someplace where no one knew me and where I could start with a clean slate. What took me completely by surprise was that God wanted to deal with my sin and wanted to heal me completely, which is a long story in itself. There are times in life when the cost of obedience is high, but the rewards far outweigh the pain. This was a several-year process of deliverance, and finally I could say there was joy in obedience. I was nearly engaged to someone other than Gavin in 1989. Young people, seek God about your life's partner. Don't just settle. Do a missions trip on your own or some sort of adventure where your focus is something else or Jesus. Pray and fast about your marriage partner. And please, please obey the deep inner promptings of the Holy Spirit, even if it's unbearably painful at the time. The rewards will far outweigh the, the pain. I promise you. Thankfully, my eyes were open to see that he wasn't right for me. And there was joy and obedience. About 10 years ago, I had a recurring dream about a friend who I had had a disagreement with several years before. And every time I would wake up, I would sense the Holy Spirit say, go and reconcile. Finally, after months of pushing this to the side, And I had literally, I had months of the same dream. I plucked up the courage to call her. We went out for lunch, chatted through our stuff and our misunderstandings, and God restored our relationship. There was joy in obedience. A few months ago, I felt a strong urge to give a community person $100. Really, Lord? I don't have that extra. The urge was so, so strong. I knew that I had to had to obey. The timing was right. God knew what she needed, and there was joy in obedience. The examples could go on for hours. We could be in this room for hours with all of us sharing stories, and I know that many of you sitting here have stories where you have taken the risk, where you have taken that step, and where there was joy in obedience. As we end this morning, I want to encourage you to press in and grab hold of freedom that comes through obedience. The abundant life that Jesus has promised you will come when you take radical steps of obedience and follow his promptings. And don't forget, this is not about stressing and striving. This is about surrender and letting him take the lead. Like Cindy reminded us a few months ago, the acronym of STOP that God had given her, which is such a fitting way to end this morning. Surrender. Let him take the reins of your life. Trust. Trust that you are hearing his voice, which leads to obey. And once we have obeyed his voice, that leads to praise. May God bless his word planted 
into our hearts this morning. May the seeds planted bear much fruit for God's glory and for his kingdom. Be encouraged as you leave today. There is much joy in obedience. Let's stand together and pray. You are worthy of our praise, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Lord, you've spoken a word to us today, and we want to be obedient to step forward into what you've called us to. And some of the prayer team are making their way to the front. If you know that you need prayer today, just make your way to the front. We're just going to end with a simple chorus. Hallelujah. We're just going to sing that together. and Just continue to let the Holy Spirit minister to you. If even through this time, you know there was something that just um, resonated in your heart through the message and you want to leave a prayer request in what Kevin was talking about at the back as you leave. Um, thanks, Brittany, for, for doing that. So awesome. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. This word is now. And if you've been challenged in any way, I encourage you to grab hold of the word. Grab hold of, of someone to pray together with you and Make things right. If there's something the Holy Spirit convicted you about, make things right. Let's sing this together. Just very simple. Hallelujah.